You're all too soon. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Wednesday night Bible study at Bethel Christian Center. I'm Rhonda Christ, the associate pastor, and I have been preaching for the last month or so. My title is How Not to Be Miserable. And as the way that I put things together is I meditate on it. I think about it, and all day I think about, okay, these are the points I'm going to make, and these are the scriptures that I'm going to use, and then I get here on Wednesday afternoon, and I put it all in the PowerPoint. And it works just great, except that today I put the whole thing in the wrong format. And so then I had to go reformat everything, and so, bring it up, sweetie. And so... That was me stalling until Jack got it all loaded and everything, because it was my fault. But I did come in tonight to a very interesting conversation about why are frijoles called refried beans. I, are, and I found out that you don't even necessarily fry them. You can, but they're mostly just cooked in a crock pot or some kind of a pot on the stove all day. And... You don't even necessarily fry them. The English language makes no sense so often, but that's okay. Okay, now let's get to what we're doing, and we'll start off with a word of prayer. Father God, thank you for everything, for making us your children, for making us exist, for creating this beautiful universe where we live and we move and we have our being in you, and that our spirits have been revived, made born again, have been sealed away in absolute perfection. Help us ever to be conscious of your Holy Spirit that lives inside of us to change the way we think, to change the way we behave, so that we can live happy and productive lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, I listed many different ways of being miserable over the last month or so. But what we are talking about is how to be miserable, pursue bad relationships. And every one of us is guilty of this. Maybe not right now at this moment, but at some point in your life, you have or you will pursue a bad relationship. Because we are human, we make dumb decisions sometimes, we don't always listen to the Holy Spirit. Or sometimes relationships that we're in turn sour and we don't know what to do. Or anyway, let's move on. Okay, so these are the kinds of bad relationships I listed. There's the one-sided relationship. We discussed this two weeks ago where you give more than the other person does or you need something or you feel like you need something and you're trying to get something out of that relationship. An abusive relationship. You can either be the victim or the abuser. And sometimes we don't even see how abusive we're being. It was just normal. It's how I was raised. Not a good excuse. So we need to be very honest with ourselves. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. We'll move on. There's the violated relationship. Now when we... And there was one more. There are two more, but... As I said, it was in the wrong format, and I was desperately trying to figure things out. And Anyway, the other two are the unequal relationship and the finished relationship. And it is highly possible that as I'm going along, I may click it, and that slide may show up out of nowhere. My apologies. Just bear with me. Okay. Abusive relationship. We all know what is physically abusing. That is when someone physically hurts you. Now, we are not talking about spanking a child. When Mike and I were working in the youth group and now working in the school, we can tell you which kids are spanked and which ones are, are abused. We can tell you which ones are spanked and which ones are not. Because the ones that are not, by and large, are brats. They feel the whole world revolves around them. Their parents try to reason with them, or they just ignore them. My I have family members that were not spanked, but they were screamed at constantly. And I would so much rather have a quick 
smack on the butt, or the booty if you don't like the word butt, which we talked about this a few weeks ago, right? Why is butt a bad word? Anyway, I would rather have a swift smack on the butt than be screamed at. We'll be dealing with that when we get into uh, verbal abuse, sexual, any unwanted sexual behavior from someone toward you, whether it's harassment in the workplace, whether it's from a parent, step-parent, neighbor, uncle, aunt, cousin, pastor, youth leader, YMCA, Boy Scouts, doesn't matter. Any unwanted sexual behavior. Verbal abuse. That's what we're going to focus on tonight. But there's also emotional, mental. And then, remember I just said that probably the slides will pop up? There it is. I got the slides out of order. There they are. Now we see them all. <sighs> okay. An abusive relationship. Why would people stay in an abusive relationship? One way is they say to themselves, well, I deserve it. This is an interesting person to me that says I deserve it. You know how a person in an abusive relationship that says I deserve it often behaves? They behave in ways that will encourage the abuse because they deserve it. You know, who cares? Oh, yeah, I'm going to go spend all of our money. I don't care if he beats me up. He beats me up anyway. Sometimes they're, they're very cringing and cowardly, but other times they do the absolute opposite to keep the cycle going. Now, I get something out of it. I don't know how many abusive, physically abusive relationships I have seen where the other person gets something out of it. When we talked about one-sided, you remember how I listed why you would be in a one-sided, what you would be getting out of it? And one of those things was complaining rights. There are people who don't feel like they have anything to offer anyone, and so they go for sympathy. That's easy. So I'm sorry, but i got to say that people that are in an abusive relationship and know it and don't do anything about it, most of the time they're lazy for another thing. I'll lose something if I deal with it. Why a woman who marries into money would deal, would allow her husband to beat her up, or vice versa, is because I'll lose the money if I deal with it. Or I'll have to change myself. If you're going to get out of an abusive relationship, you are going to have to change. You're going to have to change the way you think, the way you behave, what you will do. You're going to have to get out of your comfort zone to get out of an abusive relationship. And people are lazy and they don't want to. They would rather be slapped around or yelled at or manipulated than actually do something to move out of it because then they have to admit that they're wrong. And it's just great to be able to blame it all on everybody else. Okay, verbal abuse. I'm not talking about occasional rudeness. If you have never snapped at your spouse or your children, raise your hand. Oh, okay. Ben never has. Awesome, Ben. Okay. We all have bad days. We all say stupid things. We all spout off when we shouldn't. The trick is, do we come back and say, man, I am so sorry. I never should have done that. We are talking about constant criticism and belittling. You can't do anything right. Anything you do, they redo or they tell you how stupid you are, how bad you are, how ugly you are, how fat you are, or whatever. And why, you know, you're lucky that I'm married to you or you're lucky that I put up with you. Uh, or a raised voice, cursing, threatening. When do we need to raise our voices? Let's talk about it. When the other person is talking 
and they are absolutely out of line and they will not stop, you're probably going to have to raise your voice. If your children are running around in the street and you see a car coming, you're probably going to need to raise your voice. If there is so much confusion going on in the room and there's so much noise and you need to be heard, you should probably raise your voice. If you are angry, especially with your spouse, do you really need to raise your voice? Now, the reason that I use this term raised voice is because the word yelling has its own connotation. Yelling can mean raising the voice, or it can mean speaking out of turn and speaking critically, scolding. That term yelling, I really, really try to avoid because there are people that will say, well, they yelled at me. And what they mean is they came to me and said, we've got some issues and here they are. They yelled at me. Didn't raise a voice, didn't call any names, didn't say anything at all belittling, just pointed out, here are some issues. And then they go and tell, I mean, I go tell Roberta that Pam yelled at me when all Pam said was, hey, this isn't right, let's work this out, which is scriptural. And so many people think that when things happen to us that are abusive, that we just have to let it go and ignore it. Remember we talked about excusing? The big difference between excusing and forgiving. In forgiveness, you deal with it. You deal with it the way the word tells you to. You go to the person who hurt your feelings and say, hey, this hurt my feelings. Did you mean to hurt my feelings? What can we do for me to, you know, um, can we work something out here? If, if you're angry, if I've done something to offend you that you would hurt my feelings like that, tell me. And let's work it out. Let's reason together. But you never need to be cussed out. You never need to cuss your children out. You never need to cuss out the waiter who keeps getting your order wrong. I drove through a restaurant. Oh, I'll just tell you, it was Del Taco. And I ordered a small chocolate shake and a small strawberry shake. One for Mike, and for some reason I wanted strawberry. And so he read my order back because I had a few other things, and he said, okay, so that was a small strawberry shake and a small vanilla shake. And I said, no, it's a small chocolate shake. Okay, a small strawberry shake and a small chocolate shake. I said, great, yes. So I get to the window, and he hands me a small chocolate shake and a small vanilla shake. And I said, um, this was supposed to be strawberry. And he literally said, I don't know why I have vanilla on the brain. And he goes, give it back. And I said, no, 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 it's okay. It was after church on a Wednesday. I was tired. I wanted to go home. Hang on, I have to cough. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. But there are people that would have cussed him out for that. When is it necessary to cuss somebody out? If they are abusing you physically, you may need to do so in order to intimidate the person. Pastor Ron tells me about uh, a police officer, a member of our church, fabulous man, sweetest, kindest man you ever met, didn't raise his voice, I mean, his good family, wife, kids, just a good, solid man. But when he came across an armed suspect, he completely turned the other way and raised his voice, yelled, I mean, raised voice, a string of obscenities because there are people that only respond to that. So if you're in immediate danger by someone, maybe that could help in the situation, but probably not your spouse and certainly not your kids. Or Becky, when your donut's not there. That was the senior pastor telling me that that is apparently an, an exceptional, uh, an acceptable situation. There we go. Okay. And those who don't know, that was a joke. Okay. Here we go. What's next? I don't know because it will move.
Oh, there's the cursor. So we know something's going on. Oh, don't curse. Ooh, that's the problem. All right. All right. Next, angry outbursts. Oh, people that just, you never know. That gets in the manipulation. But if people just all of a sudden yell out of nowhere and they give like a rant, ranting can be verbal abuse, especially if it's directed at you. Ranting will break a child's spirit. It will destroy a relationship. People that come together in marriage and something happens and one of the spouses has had enough and then it all comes out and you always this and you never that and you don't care anything about me and blah, 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 blah. I'm sure no one has ever experienced that in their marriage, has never fallen victim to that particular temptation, right? I mean, I never, I never lie, so yes, I have. That's not, that is verbal abuse. Okay, now, let's go on. Emotional or mental abuse. These two things are sort of interchangeable. The number one way to emotionally or mentally abuse someone is to consistently lie. This is in any relationship. And the worst people that you can lie to are your children. Because they will never have any trust in you. And when you share the gospel with them, they're not going to believe you because they don't trust you. And they're going to learn to lie themselves because, after all, that's how my parents do it. And so that must be how the world works and what I have to do. Now, if there's anybody out there that has children under, say, eight or nine watching right now, I'm about to do spoilers about Easter and Christmas right now. So you might want to move your kids away from the camera. My mom never told me that there was a Santa Claus. We watched all the specials on TV. My stocking that was knitted for me by my godmother when I was a baby has Santa Claus going down a chimney. We had Santa Claus on our wrapping paper. We had a really nice, um, like a figurine of Father Christmas. It was all ornate, you know, it was all foo-foo like my mom liked. But I knew that it wasn't real. I knew that every present came from my parents or family or friends. I never in a million years would have dreamed that a great big fat guy was going to come down our chimney. But the story was fun. And where it came from, at our Christmas service, I had Pastor Margie read a little thing that I wrote up about St. Nicholas. Because the St. Nicholas became Santa Claus because of his generous nature. And his feast day was right around Christmas, so, you know, things all get mixed up. But I did not tell my children. Mike and I didn't tell my children that there was Santa Claus. Now, in Mike's family, he didn't believe in Santa Claus either. He just knew that whatever present said from Santa on it was the good one. All the ones from mom and dad were usually clothes. But the one that said from Santa was the evil Knievel motorcycle or the Hot Wheels or not Barbies. In my house, it would have been the Barbie. But Santa is not a big deal to us. But we never believed in him. We never believed in the Easter Bunny. Again, we watched the special. We saw how the, the Easter Bunny would collect all of the eggs and he would dye them and he would bring them to children, you know, Peter Cottontail and all of that. And we always have Easter baskets. We do an Easter egg run here, not because we're worshiping the Easter Bunny. Those kids know good and well that it was volunteers from the church who stuck the candy in those plastic eggs and set them out all over the field. And if they aren't smart enough to have figured it out for themselves, there are pictures all over Facebook of my volunteer team. We never were lied to. 
Not even in that. Not even in little white lies. There were things that we were not told as children, and when we asked, we would be told, you're too young to understand that right now. When you get older, we'll talk about it again. And it irritated my mom because every year, there was a certain thing I wanted to know, and finally she told me. And right now I don't remember it. I just remember her telling me how persistent I was and how she couldn't believe I remembered it. I don't remember it at all, but that's what she said I did. Any kind of untruthfulness can be emotional or mental abuse. Confusion. Oh, there are just people that confuse the snot out of you, right? You never know what they're going to do, what they're going to say, and that moves on to two other things. One is mood swings. One minute they're fine, the next minute they're ranting at you. Or any kind of manipulation. But the constant confusion, forever changing their mind, And I don't mean, you know, the woman's prerogative and all of that. I mean, they change their story. One day, what the person said to them is this. The next day, all of a sudden, there's more. Or then the next day, it never even happened. Or, you ever know anybody like that? You can't get a straight answer out of them? Hand grenades are straw man arguments. You know what those are. You're having a discussion about something. And all of a sudden, the person says, oh, yeah, well, you did da-da-da-da-da 50 years ago. Or, well, what I do isn't as bad as what you do. You do blank. Or a straw man argument when they take, maybe it's kind of related to the subject, but they completely go off somewhere else, and then you're arguing this point, and a lot of times you're talking to them about something that you found offensive with them, but they have put all the blame back on you, or they are talking about how you don't deserve to be able to talk to them like that, and you're all looking at me like, you know somebody like that. I hope it's not you. It's been me before, I admit it. But this kind of a thing just is so annoying. The constant confusion, this is not where the scripture should be, but it's a good one. I tell you this, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak, every hand grenade you toss, every straw man argument that you bring up, everything you say to cause confusion. Mood swings never knowing how they will react to anything. You're walking on eggshells. You never know what's going to set them off. Or what is okay one day is not okay the next. Or something that should have been an issue isn't, and something that shouldn't be an issue is. Manipulation happens like this. You owe me. You did such and such and so you owe me. In a relationship, in a marriage, where one has committed an infidelity and then the other one holds it over their head for the next 40 years, that happens. Identity, but I'm your mother, I'm your wife, I'm your husband. I know a woman whose mother was living in her house. She and her husband owned the house. The mother was living with them. She was not paying rent. She was not buying groceries. Nothing. They were exclusively taking care of her. They were married, had been married for many years, had children, and the old woman said to the wife, I'm your mother, you have to do what I say. And the wife had to say, you are a guest in this house. I left my mother and father, and I cleave to my husband. This is our home, and if you want to live here, you will do what I say. But there are a lot of people who don't do that. 
They keep that relationship going because they don't know how to set boundaries. And if you're in a relationship like that and you've got an abusive parent and you're an adult child and that abusive parent is living with you, I am encouraging you right now to seek counseling because that should not be. Or, but I'm your wife, you, you need to do this for me, but, or accuse you of being a bad person. You can't just be asked, would you please wash the dishes? And let's say you're asked to wash the dishes and let's say you kind of drag your feet. Well, why don't you do something nice for once? You never do anything around here. You need to on and on and on. If you've been in a relationship like that, you know what it's like. The problem is when we grow up and we consider that that kind of behavior from our elders is normal, we turn right around and do it to our kids and do it to the people around us. And how come I have to work so hard? Because you won't lift a finger to help me. There was a student in our school and his dad would not ask him would you please take the trash out every night? He would get mad at the kid, I don't know, about once every other week for not just taking the trash out when it was, it was full. And the kid's going, okay, um, if you want to make it my job, great, I'll do it. But then he would go to do it sometimes and it had already been done, accusing you of being a bad person. Now, how not to be miserable? Here we go. If it's physical or sexual abuse against you or a dependent, you better leave. What's difficult is sometimes this happens in the workplace. In that case, you need to make up your mind, is this a hostile environment or that I can't abide by? Maybe you need to report it to HR. Maybe you need to say something. And then if nothing gets done, then you got to leave. But if it's in the home and it's you or your child, leave. There was a situation when my sister was in eighth grade and there was a teacher that didn't like her. Now, 99 times out of 100, I'm going to side on the teacher. But in this particular case, this teacher did not like her and made disparaging remarks about her in front of the whole class. And I don't just mean something like, well, okay, we, we aren't going to talk about that subject today. We did yesterday when you weren't here. We need to move on. This was stuff like, I don't know what your problem is, why you miss so much school. Maybe if you weren't sick all the time, you'd get better grades in front of other students. Or, well, I know that you think that your parents will just get you anything that you want. And that wasn't even at this school. It was at a different one. This teacher was just a jerk. And finally, her father had to say, okay, I'm done, and took my sister out of that school and put her in another one. Because at the time, the harassment laws and those kinds of a thing, they didn't exist. And this teacher would not change her behavior, but the principal wouldn't fire her either wouldn't make her do it, even though there were witnesses who heard her say these things. Still, the board would not fire her, censure her. They tried to put Christy in a different class, even promoted her a grade to do it, but that teacher still harassed her. Now, at Bethel, we would never dream of that. That is awful. But there are times, in that case, of course, it wasn't physical or sexual, it was verbal, but so if, and you'll see in my response, there are times you got, just got to leave. Now, I tell you not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. Remember we talked about the difference between a slap and a punch? But let's pay t attention who is slapping you? An evil person. An evil person slaps, and you don't have to be in relationship with an evil person. 
But there are so many people that will excuse why they stay in an abusive relationship with that scripture. Physical abusers can change with counseling and repentance. And by repentance, I don't just mean saying sorry. I mean changing their ways. Just like a spouse that has erred and has come back, they can change their ways. That's in a physical. However, once there's been sexual abuse, it is most probable that the relationship is finished. Dr. Laura, if you're familiar with her on the radio, brilliant woman, she said, especially if it's the biological parent, let's say the dad abuses or rapes the daughter, they've torn up their dad card. That's a finished relationship. And the most evil thing that the mom can do in that situation is insist that the child still maintain a relationship with the abuser or the other way around. Sometimes it's the mom that's the abusive one and the dad doesn't do anything about it. We are familiar with a family. This to me is about the most horrific thing I can imagine, but they had three sons one of the son had three daughters, another son had one daughter, and their grandfather sexually molested them for years. And when finally the, young, the youngest girl, when she turned 18, she told her boyfriend. But the grandpa would say things to them like, well, one of them was, um, had access to a gun. He was in a, uh, law enforcement. And he literally said to them, now don't tell your dad, because you know if your dad finds out, he'll come and kill me, and then he'll be sent to prison and you'll never see him again. Horrible, horrible, evil, wicked, demonic man. But when it all came to the surface, and the son had to um, call the police on his father and get his father arrested. The mother, the grandma said, you told me you stopped doing that. Evil, wicked, horrible, demonic woman. That relationship is finished with both of them. And in her case, we'll get into the violated relationship and into codependency, but we're not there tonight. Verbal abuse. How do you handle verbal abuse? How do you handle somebody who is constantly criticizing, belittling you, embarrassing you, who yells at you, who threatens you, who does all these things? Don't ignore it. The worst thing you can say is, oh, that's just how they are. We had dinner with some friends, and they were talking about the husband's sister-in-law, and she's awful, says horrible, horrible things at family gatherings, but oh, that's just how she was raised. She doesn't know any better. We get into excusing. If you excuse abuse, you're abusing whoever the victim is, whether it's you or your kids or whomever else. Point it out when it happens. We read a book called Assertive Discipline 38, 37 years ago when we were first married. And it says, there is nothing wrong with you stating your needs and wants. I'm going to say that again. There is nothing wrong with you stating your needs and wants. And there is nothing wrong with you saying, I don't like it when you say those words to me. Would you please come up with a better way? Would you please, or how about instead of saying this, how about you say this instead? There is nothing wrong with that. There is nothing wrong with saying, there is no need for you to shout at me. There is no need for you to use that kind of language with me. I don't like it when you do that. I want you to do this instead. But boy, does that take a lot of change on the part of the victim. That's why a lot of people just would rather not do anything. Insist that it stop. And if it doesn't, you're going to have to leave. 
I've got scriptures. You speak the truth in love. You speak the truth in love. Are you a believer? You speak the truth in love. Better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and angry woman. There is also a scripture in Proverbs that says, better to dwell on the roof of the house than with a contentious and angry woman. And there was a man in our church who could not get his wife to stop being abusive. He literally went outside, got the ladder, and got on the roof of his house and sat there. I believe they worked things out after that. As charcoal is to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful, so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Everything that comes out of your mouth should be encouraging to the person who hears it. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are, you can read the list, I underlined outbursts of anger. Let's call it ranting. Angry, screaming, ranting is not right. And yet, in our culture in particular, we seem to think that the occasional screaming at somebody is okay, but it's not. Outbursts of anger, causing dissension, division, um, quarreling. You ever deal with a person that no matter what you say, it's like they're just trying to pick a fight? Have you ever been in a mood like that yourself? Now, emotional or mental abuse, if you're dealing with a person who keeps lying to you, you're going to have to point it out and discuss it. I had a friend that I thought was my friend, and she lied to me constantly. And I was stupid enough to just say, forget it. And then it became, I got a report, and I had to check it out. And when I confronted her with it, she would say things like, oh, well, they just misunderstood what I said. That's a manipulator. A lying tongue, a lying tongue hates its victims. There is a scripture that says that God hates a lying tongue, but this if someone is lying to you, they hate you. They have no respect for you. They think you're stupid. They think you have to be snowed. Wow. Moving on. Confront confusion. If the things that cause confusion are happening, say, wait a minute. That's not what you said yesterday. If they're changing their story, if they're changing what they said or whatever else, confront it. And it could be a learned habit. We had a lady in our church that everything, she was in uh, lay ministry, and she, we watched her go up and schmooze and manipulate people into doing stuff. And we're like, why is she doing that? We found out this is the only way she could get anything out of her parents. She didn't even realize what she was doing. If, there, if you've got mood swings going on, confront it. A person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Now this is talking about a person who is between both the world and, and God. The next verse says they should not expect to receive anything from God. And if you've got a person who keeps doing this kind of stuff, they shouldn't expect to get anything from you. But so often we're afraid to say anything. Especially if it's the kind of person that rants and raves and screams at you one minute, and then the next minute they're fine. And it's like, what just happened? There's no apology. There's no acknowledging it. It gets swept under the rug. This says, let your yes be yes and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Once again, has anybody ever said, I'll do something, and then something came up and you couldn't? That's understandable. But 
the person who says they will and then they constantly crap out, flake out, I guess crap's a bad word, sorry, flake out, back out, or the person who one minute it's okay for you to say that, but the next minute it's not okay for you to say that. Guilt. Now, if they're manipulating you by saying, listen, I did this for you. I need you to do this for me. If it's a, an occasional thing, if they have a point, by all means, consider it. But if they do it all the time, they probably don't have a point. So if they don't, say so. And if you get into an argument, what do you do? If you can't make the other person see what, what is going on, you leave. And I don't mean you leave the marriage, you leave the relationship. I mean, you just may need to walk out of the room. You may need to walk out of the house. Identity. I don't care if it's your mother, your wife, your husband, your son, your brother, your boss. If it affects your well-being or your relationship with God, you got to politely refuse. Yes, I understand that they have a serious problem, and I probably could help them, but I have already worked 80 hours this week. I'm exhausted and haven't seen my family. They need to deal with this on their own. Oh, that's hard for some people, especially people in the ministry. People in the ministry get a Messiah complex that we have to go fix everything all the time, and, you know, it's Rhonda to the rescue and that kind of thing. And it doesn't matter who it is. And it doesn't matter what they've done for you. If it's affecting your well-being or your relationship with God or your family, if we go into priorities, there are people in your life that are more important than others. The most important human being in my life is me. The second is my husband. My father is on the list, but he's further down on the list. After my children and after my job, my ministry. He does not take precedence over him. I don't remember if I talked about it, but there was a man. He was married. He got divorced. He married another woman. But every time his ex-wife wanted him to go do something for him, he dropped what he was doing and would go help her because he felt like he was obligated. Well, she is the mother of my children. And it's one of those, who cares? Yeah, great, she is. But this is your wife now. Or this is your, or this is your church. Your church and the people in your church are considered your household of faith. Remember Jesus said, who are my mother and brothers and sisters? Those who follow the will of the Father. Not the ones that are biologically related to them. There are times when we have to put our foot down about being with relatives that are awful to us, especially if we have kids. You're a bad person. What do you do if they try to tell you that you're a bad person? There's really nothing that you can do. Now, what do you want to do? Oh, yeah, well, I am not a bad person. I do da 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 Or, no, basically about all you can say is, I'm sorry you feel that way. What else can you say? They'll get you defending yourself to the point that the issue is completely lost, and now you're just in an argument. Or you get to the point, okay, fine, I will do the dishes. Even though I have a broken leg, I will get up and do the dishes. If someone asks you to do the dishes, just do the dishes. Anyway. So now there is... All kinds of condemnation. There is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And if you know for a fact that your heart is in the right place and your relationship with God is in the right place and that you are giving of yourself as you can, not at the expense of God or those higher on the priority list, there is no condemnation from other people that can even stick. Now, if you're going out and you're wasting all of your money gambling 
And they're saying to you, wait a minute, I'm your wife, I'm your husband, this money is mine too. Completely different story. But if you're belonging to Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. Now, from the Father, there is none, period, in any, at all, regardless of how you're behaving. But Paul tells us over and over to be above reproach. And what that means is live your life in a way so that nobody can complain about you. Apparently it can be done. I don't know anybody who has. I would love to say that I live like that all the time. <clears throat> but those who work for me back there might say something different when I forget to fill out paperwork that I insist other people do and things like that. <clears throat> ben, anyway. <laughs> Poor Ben. Poor Ben and Jack. I did all of this. I announced Al Carranza's service for Saturday, and I forgot to do the paperwork. And it's my department. Sum up. Change how you see things. Or another way of putting it is change how you think. You do that, and you'll change how you deal with things, and you won't be so miserable. And it's not easy. It's hard. But it can be done, and it's what the Lord wants for us. He wants us to be strong. He wants us to stand up for what's right. Remember, love doesn't rejoice when wrong happens. Love rejoices when justice and we're not talking justice as if you're the one who gets to hand out the punishment. But justice in that you stop bad behavior from happening out of you or to you or to other people as far as it depends on you. As much as you possibly can. One of the worst things that can happen to a church is to have divisions. Paul talks about that, and this group doesn't like this group over here, and, and infighting. We have a large organization with, how many employees do we have? We have over 100, I know that. Maybe 130, 150 employees in all these different departments. And sometimes money comes in that goes to one department and not to another one, and the other department might resent it. Or maybe two departments want the sanctuary at the same time, and the decision is made to go with this department, and this department gets their feelings hurt. Or this and that and the other. There was a time, this was more than 20 years ago, when the church, the school was very large, so was the church. We were trying to coexist, and the leadership in the school, which was not Pastor Ron at the time, was incredibly antagonistic toward the church. And the teachers began to talk amongst themselves, saying that the school was the unwanted stepchild of the church. And finally, the pastor had to get involved and tell them, if you don't want to work here, don't work here. But quit bad-mouthing the parent organization. If we didn't want a school, we wouldn't have a school. And at that time, the church was financially funding the school. This, I mean, years and years ago. I don't think we have even one teacher. We may have one teacher now who was there then. But we don't have problems with that teacher. That teacher's totally on board. We're all cool. Everything's fine. But it was terrible. And so as Mike and I have come in and the school suddenly exploded, we're having to make adjustments. And we're working very, very hard to make allowances for each other, to cover each other's, I'm going to say it, butts. Because we are all here for the same reason. And all of us as Christians, we're here for the same reason. We have a relationship with God through Jesus. And we are so happy and grateful that we want everybody else to have one too. And that is our purpose. And whether they like the way we dress or the way that we do our hair or other Christians don't like the fact that I'm in the pulpit or because I'm a woman or because they don't think we should speak in tongues and we're crazy. and It doesn't matter. We are here to preach Jesus and him crucified. Yes. 
and him raised from the dead and reigning in victory in this life. And that's what we're here for. So let's not be distracted. Let's just, if it's a bad relationship, let's let it go or let's work on changing ourselves so that we can change that relationship if possible. When I was a little girl, I was very strong-willed. I know nobody in here believes that. But I was cute, and so my mother didn't want to swap me. And she was having problems, and she went into a Berean bookstore, they were pretty new, and found a book. Because she'd been praying, Lord, tell me what to do. And she found out in this book that she was going to have to discipline herself to discipline me. Otherwise, I would have been a brat. I mean, I've acted like a brat before, but I wasn't a brat. But when she had to discipline herself to discipline me, that is something we all need to do. We have to discipline ourselves to keep our relationships in line. And if the other person isn't going to cooperate, we're going to have to release them to the Lord. And it's not easy. But as we do this, we'll be happier and happier. All right. Pastor Mike? By the way, you know in the Bible where it talks about blessed are they and blessed is them. You know the word blessed, you know what that means? Happy. Just blessed sounds more churchy. And, and you really know your churchy, if you don't say blessed, you say blessed. Okay. So, yeah, God wants you to be happy, and he tells us how. But we still have to do stuff. I was remembering what we talked about Sunday, and in Second Peter chapter 1, uh, looks like in verse 4, it says, These are the promises from God that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption that's caused by human desires. It's the stuff we want from other people that tends to get us in trouble and the stuff they want from us that tends to get us in trouble. What we need to do is live in God's nature instead. How much of this junk do you think God put up with? Have you ever read how Jesus treated people? He was kind. He was fair. And if you were out of line, he called you on it. So it's just interesting stuff, interesting things to think about. So now it's our turn to give. We can wrap up the service and take the opportunity to give to support what God's doing around here. Um, there's how, there's the website, you can do that, you can download the app, Todd's walking up front with offering envelopes, just in case. Al's service, Al Carranza's memorial service is right here in the sanctuary at 9 o'clock Saturday morning. And so, so many of them, yeah. Yeah, so... We're going to have a good time celebrating the life of one of our best friends and somebody that I've known for 38 and a half years, almost 39 years. So knew he and Teresa and their kids and have known him the whole way. And it's just, I worked for him and we're a lot better friends when I quit working for him because... You know, he could be kind of a strong-headed guy. And not me. But I was a fairly arrogant 20-year-old, and he was a fairly strong 33-year-old, and we butted heads when we worked together. But as soon as we quit working together, we got along great. We've been friends for a long time. So we're going to have a good time celebrating his going to heaven he's probably not even going to pay attention to what we're doing because he's in heaven. <laughs> and 
You know, some people say, well, he's up there focusing on Jesus. Yes, but he's focusing on Jesus, number one, with his wife, Teresa, and his daughter, Laura, and his family, and people that have gone ahead, and they're just getting it all ready for us. So it's, it's a good time. So I'd encourage you to be here. We're going to have a lot of folks here, but it'll be worth it. That's this Saturday at 9. So, um, okay, so we've done the offering. We can close in prayer, and we can get out of here. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for a wonderful day and the opportunity that we have to just spend a little time together with you. We're with you all the time, but when we get to spend time with you together with our church family, it's special, and we appreciate it, and we don't take it for granted. So, Father, I know that your hand of blessing and protection is on all of us, and we thank you for that, and we ask you to bring us back safely on Sunday, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Have a great night, everybody.